Shalom, welcome back. I want to make a series of videos just uh, answering some of the objections I get. Because a lot of the questions tend to be just four or five questions. Um, you know, sometimes it's, it's worded in the form of an objection, and other times it's just somebody, you know, wanting information. Um, but either way, it's, it's kind of the concept behind the question. And maybe by addressing some of these questions, it might make it a little bit easier for people to understand where I'm coming from. Um, you know, sometimes these objections come from people that are best described as, you know, scoffing. And, of course, whether you answer the question or not, it's not going to matter to them because they're still going to scoff. But um, but I would like to address some of the, the questions I get. So tonight I'm going to talk about this question. It's usually asked in a form like this. If the sacrifices were not commanded by Yahuwah but were made up by men, then that means Yahuwah is incompetent or it means he's a liar or you know something similar. Um, sometimes it's phrased as, if you're saying that Yahuwah did not command sacrifices, then you're calling him a liar or something similar to that. Um, so I guess, first of all, this accusation that, that he's a liar if if the sacrifices were never commanded. I don't believe that that's really a logical thing to say. Because, first of all, he did warn us numerous times in Scripture that he did not desire sacrifices. He says, For I delight in kindness and not slaughtering, in the knowledge of Elohim more than burnt offerings. Or in Samuel, uh, 1 Samuel 15, 22, Samuel says, Do not, or does Yahuwah delight in burnt offerings and slaughterings as in obeying the voice of Yahuwah? So you can't really say that he's a liar whenever he would also insert in the scriptures clues or statements saying that he did not desire sacrifices. Psalm 51, For you do not desire slaughterings, or I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offerings. The slaughterings of Elohim are a broken spirit, a heart broken and crushed, O Elohim. These you do not despise. So there's a contrast here between slaughterings and burnt offerings on the one hand and a broken spirit and a contrite heart on the other. And so here in verse 17 it says, These you do not despise. Well, the implication is the other thing he does despise. So it's not just that he does not desire slaughtering, he despises it. It's not just he doesn't delight in burnt offering. He despises burnt offering. And he says as much in Isaiah uh, 1, starting around verse 11. What used to me are your many slaughterings, declares Yahuwah. I've had enough of burnt offerings, of rams and the fat of fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required this from your hand to trample my courtyards? You know, the trampling of his courtyards would be bringing all these animals in. If you've ever been to, um, like, a state fair and you, you've seen the, the cattle auction there, and just look at the, the condition of the grounds. You know, they've got people that have to come out there and scoop up, you know, cow poop and all kind of stuff just to keep the, just to keep the fairgrounds clean. You can smell the, the smell of these animals from a good distance off. So if you can imagine bringing these animals into the courtyard of the temple, what the condition of the courtyard of the temple would be like. It would smell like animals, smell like, you know, poop. <laughs> it, it would get really dirty, really nasty, and then you start slaughtering these animals in the middle of it, and you've got blood everywhere. And, you know, the smell of blood, to me, is not at all appetizing. So can you, can you imagine if he never asked for animal sacrifices, the trampling his courtyard of his temple with, with these animals being brought in for a slaughter? He goes on to say in Isaiah 1, he speaks about the smoke, the smoke from the sacrifices. Now, your, your translator is probably going to say incense. But if you look up the word for incense, it's the word for smoke. He says the, the smoke is an abomination to me, which is contrary to what it says in the Torah, 
where it says it's a soothing fragrance in the Torah, but then in Isaiah it says it's an abomination to him. The stench of the smoke is an abomination to him. So you don't get the same picture in these two verses. There's a contrast. In fact, polar opposites. And people say there's no contradiction in the Scripture. Well, there's, there are. It's just we've been trained not to see it. But, you know, to say that Yahuwah is a liar because somebody changed his, his Torah and then he sends prophets later to correct them and to say, hey, look, don't believe this stuff. You know, red flag, red flag, the, something, you know, something's not right here. And the prophets are coming and telling people not to do sacrifices, but yet the priests have this written Torah that says to do sacrifices. Doesn't make you who a liar. If anything, he's trying to, to correct the liars and set the record straight. That's the reason he sends the prophets. And we can see where the sacrifices come from. I mean, he, it tells us in Scripture in 2 Kings 16. Sovereign Ahaz saw an altar that was at Damascus, and Sovereign Ahaz sent to Uriah the priest a sketch of the altar in its pattern according to all its workmanship. And Uriah the priest built an altar according to all that Sovereign Ahaz had sent from Damascus. So Ahaz sees this pagan altar, thinks it's really swell looking, and sends back to the priest and says, Hey, throw one of these together for me. And when the sovereign came from Damascus, he um, saw the altar, and the sovereign approached the altar and made offerings on it and burned his burnt offering and his grain offering. He poured his drink offering and sprinkled the blood of his peace offering on the altar. And it goes on in this chapter to list some other changes that are made. He, he pulls the um, incense altar out of the temple and sets it in the courtyard next to the, you know, this pagan Damascus altar. He changes the way that the, the big brazen lavers are set up on top of the, the oxen. He takes them off and puts them on the floor and, and makes some other changes. But you know what's not mentioned? It doesn't mention anything at all about Uriah the priest having to tear down the altar to build this new altar. You see, there wasn't an altar there in the temple prior to Ahaz ordering one built. Aside from the, the, you know, the incense altar. You know, there's a lot of things in Scripture where it says one thing in the Torah, and then you read in, in these writings like the Kings and Samuel and Chronicles. It doesn't really line up. David has his son serving as priest in the temple, but David wasn't a Levite, for instance. David eating the showbread, which was supposed to be only for the priests. Well, apparently back in David's day, there was no rule about only Levites could serve. Back in David's day, there was no rule that only the Levites could eat the bread. But that's another subject for another day. But So the point is, is that Uriah didn't have to tear down the correct altar and then he built this pagan altar. It's that there wasn't an altar there prior to this order from Ahaz to build one. So my next, I guess, counter question to this one about saying that that means that Yahuwah is an incompetent, a liar, etc. is the question, does Yahuwah have a duty to use force to prevent changes to his Torah? Because I think that's the implication of saying that it means that Yahuwah is incompetent. Sometimes this, the, the way this question is phrased will be something along the lines of, well, you say that the Torah has been changed, but I believe that my God is powerful enough to preserve his word. Or they may say he's wise enough to preserve my word. And it kind of turns things back around to where now, now I'm saying that Yahuwah is not capable of preserving his, his Bible. And that's not what I'm saying. I mean, I, I believe that the Father is fully capable of preserving his word by force if necessary. It is not beyond his power to 
strikes someone dead every time they go to make a change to a Bible. But the question is not, is he powerful enough to do that? The question is, would he do that? So, conduct an experiment. Take a Bible off your shelf at your house and take you some white out and change something. And then the next day, get up and pull that Bible back down off the shelf and see if it's magically changed back to what it was before. Did, did God strike you down when you made that change in the Bible? Did you wake up the next day and it was magically changed back to what it was before? Because if neither one of those scenarios happened, then that kind of does away with this whole theory that, that he is going to preserve his word by any means necessary. And there's a lot of people that are more or less up in arms about these, um, what they call New Age Bible versions. And back in the 90s especially, it was a big thing when um, comparing the NIV to other Bible versions like the King James, there was hundreds of changes. So whether you look at it as the NIV corrected the King James or corrupted the King James, either one of those scenarios shows you that the Bible's not infallible. Because if the King James is correct, then the NIV can't be correct also. Now, I would say that neither one of them are correct. They, they, they both have a lot of alterations. And the fact that men can erase, cover over the name of the fathers in the Bible 7,000 times, take out the name Yahuwah and insert the Lord in his place, that tells you that Scripture is not infallible. It also tells you that men are not beyond or not above going in and changing the word of Yah because they've done it. But to say that he has this obligation to, to act on our behalf, when I consider that, it reminds me of Isaiah 45. Woe to him that strives with his maker. Does the clay say to him that forms it, What are you making? Or does your, handy wait, does your handiwork say, He has no hands? What does he mean by he has no hands? Well, that's basically what we're saying if we were to say that, well, if the Bible's been changed, it's because Yahoo is incompetent or he's powerless to stop it. He has no hands. You see, we're mixing up like whether he has a duty to act or whether he gave men free will. He gave mankind free will. We, we do things all the time that he doesn't like. But he doesn't strike us dead every time we do something he doesn't like. And to say that, that he if he doesn't, that we're going to blame him for everything. I mean, are we supposed to blame Yahuwah for every single thing that happens in the world that's not perfect and righteous and good? Do we expect the Father to, to send an angel every time we're about to have a car accident and prevent us from having that wreck? We, we pray for his protection and we ask for his protection, but when, when bad things happen, does that mean we should just shake our fist at him and say, it's all your fault? If bad things happen, do we just say, well, he must have no hands? He must be incompetent? I mean, if you, if you read the Nazarene Acts, that's the argument that Simon Magus makes. And so making this argument that, well, if, if the sacrifices were added, then that means that Yehu is incompetent, we're taking on the, the side of Simon Magus. If you don't believe me, read the Nazarene Acts. This is one of the arguments that he makes. The, the fact that evil exists in the world is proof that, that God's incompetent. That's what Simon Magus says. Simon Peter says no. It's proof that, what that is, is proof that Yahuwah gave man free, you know, free will. 
Because he can make us like we're robots and we only do the right thing every time. But that's not what he desires. He desires people that choose to follow him, not people that are made to where we can do nothing else but follow him. Yahu goes on to say, the work of my hands, do you command me? Do we command him that he has to preserve the Bible by force if necessary? No. So this this statement at the top in yellow, I mean, it's, it's untenable on its face to say that that means that Yahu is incompetent if men change his word. And as we look into this a little deeper, does the Bible actually say that it's infallible? One thing that a lot of people point to is Yeshua saying that the Scripture cannot be broken. But if you actually read it in context, Yeshua is being accused of blasphemy by the Jews. And Yeshua says, is it not written in your own Torah, I said, you are Elohim. Notice he doesn't call it the Father's Torah. He doesn't call it his Torah. He says your Torah, speaking to these Jews that are wanting to stone him. It kind of sounds like what the Ebionites believe, that Moses had been given legislation from the Father, but over time it had been corrupted. And so it was no longer the, the, the legislation that we have in the, in the Pentateuch is not what the Father gave us, because it's had additions to it. But then he goes on to say, Yeshua says, if he called them Elohim to whom the word came, and it is impossible for the scripture to be broken. So see, like, if he called them Elohim, and if it's impossible for the scripture to be broken. You see, the, the doctrine of the infallibility of scripture, it, it came from the scribes and the Pharisees. Yeshua is using their own doctrine against them. He's not saying it's impossible for the scriptures to be broken. He says, if it's impossible, then you have no right to come and accuse me. Well, we can look at Jeremiah chapter 8. He says, my people do not know the right ruling of Yahuwah. And how do you say we were wise in the Torah of you who was with us? But look, the false pen of the scribe has worked falsehood. See, they've rejected the word of Yahuwah, so what wisdom do they have? Now, scribes, they, they write. The, this pen, the false pen of the scribe, is being used to write. Not, you know, it's not the oral Torah. It's the written Torah that... Jeremiah's saying is corrupted. And so in Jeremiah's day, in the 6th century B.C., even back then, the Torah had been corrupted. This is according to Jeremiah. This is a prophet of Yahuwah. This is not me saying that. So the Bible itself tells you it's not infallible. So the infallibility of Scripture is actually not biblical. And in fact, if you're saying the Bible's infallible, then you just put the Bible above Yahuwah. Actually, I guess you put it on the same level as Yahuwah. You've now got two gods. You've got, you know, Yahuwah, the Father in heaven, and then you've got your Bible. And the Bible itself, you know, paper, paper is just, very thin strips of wood, essentially. I mean, it's obviously there's more to it than that, but it, your Bible is made of wood. And how often does the Scripture speak against making these idols of wood? There's numerous places that that he Yahuwah criticizes the people because they think that this idol is speaking to them, that this idol brings their protection. And Yahuwah says, should I fall down before a log of wood? Shall I fall down, shall I prostrate myself in worship, in other words, before this piece of wood? And you may object to, to me saying that the Bible is being treated like an idol. I'm not saying the Bible is an idol. I'm saying that people make it an idol, though. 
you know, and I've, I mentioned it before, Yeshua said that he was going to send the Spirit to lead us into all truth, not a book. Yeshua said to them, Mind, beware the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And again, like I mentioned before, that's where this infallibility of Scripture comes from. It's part of their leaven that the Scripture is infallible. So, I know a lot of people don't want to hear this. Um, re religion turns us into this, this state where we're willingly blind and deaf. And Kepha in the Nazarene Acts, he, he speaks about people listening to his teaching. He says, while I teach the things that pertain to salvation, anyone who refuses to receive them and strives to resist them with a mind occupied by evil opinions, he will have the cause of his perishing not from us, but from himself. You know, there's a reason that I put a reference on just about every single piece of text that I put on the screen in my videos. As you can see here, I got this statement from the Nazarene Acts, which is also known as the Recognitions of Clement, which you can find free online in PDF form. Just Google it, Recognitions of Clement PDF, and you'll find it. Or you can Google Nazarene Acts of the Apostles, PDF, and you'll find it in a Hebraic um, version. Book 5, Chapter 8. I'll tell you exactly where you can find it. If I quote Josephus, i tell you where I'm quoting it from. If I quote the Damascus document from the Dead Sea Scrolls, i tell you where you can find that. If I quote Philo, i tell you where, I can find, where, where you can find that. I do it so you can go back and, and study this out for yourself. I don't want people following me. I don't want you believing me just because I say something. But it's clear from a lot of the objections that I get, a lot of the emails and messages I get, that there are lots of people out there that don't want to do their own studying. Um, I put out a video a while back about marriage licenses. And I told you in the video, I put a link in the description, you know, this is where you can find more information. Because I'm not a lawyer. I can't give you legal advice, but I have people emailing me. Somebody just about every week, sometimes two or three people a week, will email me about that and want me to tell them how to do it. What should I say? You know, this this or that happened, and, and how, you know, how do I respond to this or that government official? And it's like, guys, I, I told you where to get the information to know how to do this. And it's the same thing here. Like, I can't tell you what to believe. But it is your duty to study it out yourself. So, I pray that this has been a blessing to you. I hope that this has given those of you who may be on the side of, of scoffing about this belief that um, Yeshua taught against the sacrifices, and he taught his disciples a vegetarian lifestyle. Um, I pray that this has given you some things to think about, to really think about the way you're phrasing your questions and, and what you mean by it, because um, to say that mankind changing the Scripture does not make, it, it doesn't reflect negatively on the Father. It reflects negatively on us, on mankind, for, for going and changing the word of the Creator. And, and, you know, it kind of reflects bad on us for believing it, honestly. Now, when I look back at, at the way I used to be a vehement believer in the inerrancy of Scripture, I, I feel foolish now. And so I'm just trying to give you some, some things to think about yourself. So I pray that this has been a blessing for you, and I bid you good evening and shalom.